Okay, welcome everyone. This lecture will be recorded and those who comment or ask any question will be in the video. Uh, the rest of you will be anonymous. So for today, the presenter is Tor Martin Lystad, and the title for today's presentation is Design Methodology for Long Span Bridges Subject to Dynamic Wind Loads. Lessons from the Hardanger Bridge. So uh, welcome to Martin. The word is yours. Thank you, Ture. Uh, so my name is uh, Tor Martin Lista, uh, and today I will talk about my PhD work uh, regarding design methodology for long span bridges, which are subjected to uh, wind loads, dynamic wind loads, uh, and this will be in light of the lessons learned from the Hardanger Bridge full scale measurements. So a brief introduction about myself and the uh, organization around my uh, PhD work. Uh, I graduated from the uh, from NTNU with a master's degree in 2013 uh, and I've been working on the bridge department at Nordkonsult ever since. Uh, and now I'm uh, an industrial PhD uh, funded by Nordkonsult and the Research Council of Norway. And we have a collaboration with uh, NTNU and uh, the Norwegian Public uh, Roads Administration. Now I'm uh, only roughly halfway through my PhD work, so I'm afraid I don't have uh, as much published uh, results uh, as most presenters in this series have yet, but hopefully I can provide some insight into the, the problems I'm addressing in my work. Now I have a large team of supervisors. Uh, my main supervisor is uh, Professor uh, Ole Iset from NTNU. Uh, my co-supervisor from NTNU is uh, Professor Anders Rundqvist. Uh, I also included uh, a postdoc, Axel Feneshi, who, uh, who has uh, been a key colleague in this work. Uh, also in Nordkonsult, I have uh, two internal uh, supervisors. Uh, we have uh, Axel Schyte, Alexander Schyte and uh, Jon Sorensli, uh, who was uh, deeply involved with the design of the Hardanger Bridge. I would also like to briefly address some benefits from being an industrial PhD. Uh, the, the candidate often comes with some experience from the industry already, uh, and that can be beneficial in, uh, in terms of prioritizing the research uh, and focusing on what is important for practical purposes. Uh, the research knowledge, of course, can be very useful in practical projects also. Uh, a direct uh, illustration of this uh, can be the, the detailed design of the Leifjord Bridge, which is a project that Nordkonsult has been worked on, uh, on recently. Uh, and as you can see from this illustration, this, uh, the, the surroundings are, are very similar to, to the Hardanger Bridge, uh, as you will see in, in, uh, in slides coming. So, of course, uh, our lessons from the Hardanger Bridge has uh, been very very useful in such a project. Uh, and from a company's point of view, um, they have a possibility to dig deeper into, uh, into issues that they identify in their uh, projects. Uh, and of course, they, they have the ability to build competence internally. And also for the research institutions, um, they get a self-financed PhD candidate, which I'm sure they are uh, quite happy with. And also they can get uh, practical input uh, from the industry, which can be valuable for research, uh, research planning. So this is the presentation outline. Uh, I will talk a little about uh, the motivation behind my work, some background and uh, objectives. Uh, and then I will walk you through some results so far, uh, and then a few conclusions in the end. So the main motivation for this research is uh, to realize a uh, cost-efficient and reliable ferry-free coastal highway, uh, E39. Uh, this will demand building um, extreme long span bridges way beyond the scale of what has been built today. Uh, this will include uh, new bridge concepts such as uh, the submerged floating tunnels or the TLP-supported suspension bridges and also further development of already known concepts, such as uh, long suspension bridges and floating bridges. Now, 
what is common for all these concepts is that they are very sensitive to dynamic uh, environmental loads, such as uh, wind and waves. And uh, these structures we're talking about here is, is extremely slender. So the fundamental eigenmodes will have very low frequencies. And since the dynamic wind loading is, uh, uh, has an increasing energy content for a decreasing frequency, uh, the fundamental modes for such structures can be strongly excited by, uh, by wind loads. Well, the developments for the E39 project is, uh, is parallel. Um, you have uh, consultant uh, engineering companies working on concept development and also uh, also research institutions uh, working on the theoretical development. And, uh, and Nurkosert, uh, which is Norway's largest engineering consultant company, want to, want to contribute on both these parts and, and my PhD work is a, is a part of that. So just an illustration of the scale of, of the structures we're talking about here. Uh, this is a picture I took from uh, from my colleague's office wall. Uh, I think it was quite uh, illustrative. Uh, this is an overview of the uh, the end anchored uh, floating bridge proposed for for the Bjorna Fjord crossing. Uh, and if you look carefully, you can also see a cut in uh, in scale drawing of the Light Fjord bridge. Uh, I talked about this as 800 meter suspension bridge. It's a large bridge, but it's uh, completely disappearing in this uh, this scale. So, if we look at the scale in uh, in numbers and uh, in importance of the dynamic environmental loads for the design uh, for the Hardanger Bridge, which uh, has a main span of 1,310 meters, it is Norway's longest and one of the te uh, world 10 longest suspension bridges. Uh, dynamic wind loads uh, are utilizing approximately 30% of the design stresses for the bridge girder here. Now for an end anchored uh, floating bridge over the Bjorna Fjord uh, with a main span of 5 kilometers, the dynamic uh, environmental loads are utilizing uh, up to 80% of the design stresses in the bridge girder. Uh, and of course, it's uh, less critical to have a large uncertainties connected to 30% of the capacity. But when we are talking about 80% of the capacity, we need to reduce these uncertainties to achieve anything close to uh, target reliability. So to the background uh, and objectives of my research topic. Uh, NTNU and uh, the Norwegian Public uh, Roads Administration has been monitoring acceleration responses and also the wind field along the Hardang Bridge since uh, 2013. Uh, they have uh, instrumented the bridge with the 20 accelerometers uh, distributed all along the bridge girder but also in the, the top of the towers. Uh, they are also using nine wind measuring anemometers uh, of which eight are distributed along the span and also one is placed in the top of the northern tower. So to some theoretical background, uh, a turbulent wind field is random, but uh, it can be described mathematically as a stochastic process. Uh, and we base the, the mathematical description on some general assumption. Uh, the first one is the Gaussianity assumption, uh, meaning that the mean and the variance of the process is uh, can be can define the process. The stationarity assumption, meaning that the variance and mean is constant throughout the, the considered time window. And the ergodicity uh, assumption is saying that the average of values at a fixed time can be replaced by the average over the process over time. Uh, and also the homogeneity assumption, which, uh, which say that the, the spatial variation of the wind field can be neglected. So, uh, so we have the same description, not only over time, but also over space. Based on these assumption, uh, assumptions, the, the turbulent wind field can be uh, completely defined by a single point spectral density and a co-spectra. So using a model like this, we, we uh, amount to seven variables. So let's take a look at today's practice for handling uh, stochastic wind loads for design of uh, long span bridges. 
Now, if we were to have a simply supported brim uh, subjected to distributed snow load, uh, we can easily say that given a snow load with a 50-year return period, we would also get a response with the same return period. Now, for a more complicated situation uh, as dynamic wind loads, we are using uh, a very similar uh, assumption. So given that uh, we have a 50 rip turn period of a mean wind velocity, uh, we are saying that we should also get a dynamic extreme peak response close to a 50 year return period. Based on the general assumptions that I showed on the, the previous slide, uh, the dynamic uh, wind field can be modeled as a stochastic prof process, uh, provided the spectral input shown here. Uh, and we are saying now that this spectral input are so dominated by the mean wind velocity that all other parameters can be chosen deterministically based on codes or qualitative uh, considerations. In other words, the assumption is that the randomness of all the turbulence variables can be neglected. Another assumption that is basis for the present methodology is uh, is that the randomness in peak response can be neglected. Uh, so this figure in the in the middle here is is showing a, a simulated response signal of a lightly damped uh, response uh, split into 10 minute segments, and the the extreme peak of each uh, each segment is itself a, a random variable uh, following a, a, an extreme value distribution, as the one shown shown here. So now, if the the general assumptions that uh, listed previously uh, holds, this extreme value distribution will follow a a Gumbel distribution. And what we do today is uh, we we design for the mean value of this distribution. So the uh, the assumption that the randomness of the turbulence variables can be neglected uh, has been investigated by uh, Oxel van uh, for the Hadanga Bridge. Uh, and if this assumption were to hold, we would uh, expect something close to a line in such uh, response plots as uh, as these. Uh, and the measurements from the Hadanga Bridge are showing this. So we are seeing a large variability in the uh, the measured response uh, that are due to turbulence variability effects. So the objectives for, for my research is uh, to evaluate the site-specific wind field uh, measurement methods, uh, which we need to be able to use more accurate method methods for design. Uh, we want to investigate the turbulence variability effects on the buffeting response of the Hardanger Bridge. and. Uh, we wish to propose methods to account for this turbulence variability that are suitable for a practical design. Uh, and ultimately, we hope to reduce uncertainties uh, in the response calculations we, we do. Now I will uh, present uh, some of my results so far. Uh, in my first paper, uh, it's about wind fuel measurements used for design of low span bridges. And to be able to take into account the turbulence variability effects, uh, we need to get reliable site-specific wind field information also. Uh, and there are several, several ways to, to get this uh, information. Traditionally, this has been, uh, been done using site, uh, on-site mass measurements and uh, wind tunnel terrain model tests. Uh, and more recent developments have uh, introduced CFD analysis and also remote sensing uh, methods such as LIDAR technology or radars. Uh, and there are pros and cons for all, all these methods. And perhaps uh, the best uh, approach uh, would be a combination of all of them, but that might be uh, both expensive and time consuming. So uh, we have recently published a paper investigating the performance of the traditional methods for the Hardanger Bridge. Uh, and for the design of the Hardanger Bridge, uh, mass measurements and terrain model tests uh, were performed. Uh, and uh, if you see the picture in the bottom right here, you can see the position of the mast 
uh, that were used. It was placed on the on the headland called uh, Bunese, uh, to the south of the bridge. And uh, since we are now monitoring the wind field along the the actual bridge span, we can we can see how well this uh, this uh, predictions correspond with what we what we see now. So this is uh, these are wind roses for the mean wind velocity. Uh, these are only considering strong winds above uh, 15 meters per second. Uh, and the top top left figure here is the the, the mass measurements. Uh, this uh, is the A1 sensor, which is the along span anemometer in the in the south part of the span. The A6 is uh, I'm sorry. The A6 is uh, the mid span sensor, and A8 is to the north of the span. Uh, and a couple of interesting observations can be made from these figures. For the westerly winds, uh, we can see that the dominating wind direction is slightly changing towards the mid span, uh, and also uh, it, in the mid span, it's not very much corresponding to what we saw from the mass measurements, um, and that can indicate a, a pattern, a flow pattern like uh, like the top right figure here. Uh, the winds coming over this mountain and and getting channeled by the fjord. Uh, now, looking at the easterly winds, we also see a peculiar uh, uh, situation. Uh, looking at the A1 measurements, uh, so the south part of the span are are receiving most of its its uh, dominating winds from this uh, easterly fjord arm, but looking at the northern part, the A8 sensor. Is gathering most most of its uh, its uh, dominating wind flow from from this northeastern fjord arm. By looking at the the wind roses for and this is for a long wind turbulence intensity, uh, we can see that the mountain to to the to the west of the bridge is uh, causing a lot of turbulence especially in the northern part of the span for for westerly winds and um, but for the for the easterly winds it seems uh, that the the inflow situation from two different fjord arms are not uh, showing a very very different situation so to investigate uh, how the mass measurements performed uh, in predicting the mean wind velocity we have used uh, extreme value statistics to be able to to compare measurements from two different time periods. Uh, and what we see is that the mass measurements uh, are significantly overestimating the mean wind velocity uh, compared to the uh, long span measurements. Uh, we believe that this is uh, due to terrain induced wind speed up uh, effects. Uh, so what you see here is the the most uh, position on the headland uh, Bunese, which is stretching into the fjord. And um, and as wind flows over a hilltop like this, uh, the boundary layer is is uh, pressed together, creating a, a a local speed up effect close to the ground. And we were actually able to predict something very similar using only simple guidelines from the from the Eurocode uh, and also terrain model tests were were able to predict something quite uh, quite similar or what we see uh, at least for the easterly winds but um, this effect was not so clear for the westerly winds uh, due to reasons we uh, we will uh, come back to so to be able to account for turbulence variability effects, uh, we need statistical distributions also for the turbulence variables. Uh, and this, in this figure, you can see fitted log normal uh, probability distributions um, for the long wind turbulence intensity. So the green line uh, in these plots are are the fitted uh, distribution for the MOST measurements. And the A1 sensor is again in the, the southern part of the span, and the A8 is towards the northern part. So this is uh, looking at easterly winds, and we can see that uh, the variance, at least for, for the mass measurements, are, are uh, quite different from what we see along the span. Uh, and this um, could be expected. Uh, we have 
surrounding forest vegetation around the mast, uh, affecting this, of course, uh, and also uh, possible flow separation effects uh, over this headland. Now, looking at the, the westerly winds, uh, we can see a very uh, these colored figures are are um, a top view of the probability distribution along the span. So uh, for the easterly winds, we see a very homogeneous uh, situation, but for the westerly winds, we we see uh, that both the mean value and the variance of the turbulence intensity uh, distribution are changing. So again, the, this effect that we see in the northern part of the span is uh, is probably due to flow over this uh, this mountain. There was also performed terrain model wind tunnel tests for the design of the Hadang Bridge. Um, they modeled uh, two dominating wind flow uh, directions. You can see the the map cuts out uh, of uh, of the model directions here, and these were based on on the measurements from the mast. Uh, and looking at our assumed uh, wind flow pattern, uh, this is not corresponding very well with what we see along the span, uh, especially for for westerly winds. And this uh, illustrates the need to to model and test several incoming wind directions when using terrain model tests uh, in the wind tunnel. So this is uh, measured span-wise wind profiles, the mean wind velocity uh, and along wind turbulence intensity. So the gray lines are single measurements along the span uh, and the blue line is the mean of the full-scale measurements. Uh, the red and orange curves here are the measured Profiles from the from the wind tunnel tests. Uh, these are for two different incoming f uh, flow situations. The the red one is for an, a smooth incoming flow, and the the orange one is for a turbulent incoming flow subject to the terrain model. Uh, now, as we can see, the the wind tunnel tests are showing a very clear non-uniform profile, uh, and and this we cannot see. Uh, clearly, this effect in in any of the the wind sectors uh, that that we can uh, can see here for the easterly winds. Uh, now, as we talked about the model, the direction for the westerly winds did not uh, capture the dominating inflow direction very well. Uh, but uh, what is closest to the to the model direction is the sector four here, uh, and as you can see, uh, at least for parts of the span and the turbulence intensity, we are getting a very, very good correspondence to the mean value of, uh, of the, uh, the full-scale measurements, although we have a lot of variability. So, to some conclusions uh, drawn from this study, uh, the spatial inhomogeneity in the static, uh, statistical distributions of the wind field uh, can be significant in such complex terrain. Uh, and single point mass measurements may not be uh, sufficient to predict the wind field along the uh, the span. Uh, and also, wind tunnel terrain model tests uh, may provide uh, good results if the uh, if the scale, size, and tested wind directions are sufficient, sufficiently large. But this is uh, this is very important to get get uh, good information from such uh, tests. So from these uh, previous um, investigations, we saw that uh, we have a very non-uniform wind field along the bridge span. So the next study targets um, the widely used assumption of uh, wind field homogeneity. Uh, and for extreme, extremely long bridges, such as the ones proposed for the coastal highway route, uh, E39, uh, a uniform wind field for the whole structure becomes less likely. So these are um, shown uh, measured along span wind profiles uh, for the Hadanga Bridge. These are easterly winds. Uh, and here is highlighted the most extreme uh, non-uniform profiles that we have measured. Uh, and for the easterly winds, we can see a, a quite typical pattern uh, where the mean wind velocity is increasing towards the mid-span and the turbulence intensity is correspondingly decreasing. Now, for the westerly winds, we also uh, see a linear trend uh, 
uh, in the in the uh, in both the mean wind velocity and also the turbulence intensity. Uh, and as discussed earlier, uh, this is probably due to uh, the distortion of the flow due to this mountain that we have to the west of the bridge. Now we want to investigate the effect of extreme but uh, realistic non-uniform wind profiles to get an idea of, of the importance of the homogeneity assumption. And in, in previous studies on this topic, uh, only idealized non-uniform profiles has been uh, been investigated, uh, not based on on full-scale measurements like this. So uh, so based on the the measured wind profiles, we want to establish a, a probabilistic or a statistical description of the non-uniformity. Uh, and by observing the the measured profiles here, we can we can it it seems reasonable to to describe such profiles with a with a linear variation term and also a, a harmonic half wave term and then we can can write the model on a, a normalized format uh, normalized with the mid span value so using this assumed model um this uh, uniformity coefficients a and b um can be estimated by fitting the model to all the measured uh, long span wind profiles and using these uh, these estimates we can establish a joint uh, normal distributed probabilistic model for for the non uniformity that we measure so utilizing the normalized format of the uh, wind profile model we can we can simulate profiles from this uh, this uh, probabilistic model uh, that has uh, has the same long span mean, so we can compare the effects between them. Uh, and these are shown 1,000 simulations of uh, of uh, the wind profiles. So one simulation will give um, one mean wind velocity profile and also one along wind turbulence intensity profile. So so these are not uh, independent. Uh, and in these plots, uh, we have highlighted uh, the, the extreme non-uniform profiles corresponding to, to the 95th percentile of each non-uniformity coefficient. Um, so, so they can represent an, an indication of an extreme situation. So to investigate the effects of uh, some picked uh, extreme profiles, the buffeting response of the Hardagen bridge is, uh, is considered. Uh, the buffeting calculations are uh, performed in the frequency domain. Uh, and some adjustments has been made to uh, to the classical formulation of the, uh, the buffeting theory to, to account for non-uniformity. So the, the cross-spectral density uh, is now a product of the square root of the uh, auto-spectra in, in both uh, in the two points considered, uh, the spectral uh, buffeting force spectral density matrix will be uh, based on a varying buffeting force load transfer function, uh, and also the the motion induced forces are now integrating a, a non-uniform wind profile. So, looking at a few chosen non-uniform uh, profiles that we we have simulated uh, we can see that for the for the red red uh, wind profiles uh, all response quantities this is uh, extreme responses along the bridge uh, bridge span so for all all response quantities for the red combination is showing a lower response than the uniform situation and and this is uh, an indication of a canceling out effect between between the uh, the opposite trends of the mean wind velocity and the turbulence profiles. Now looking at the, the blue situation here, where we have a large increase in turbulence intensity to, to the north of the span, we, we see that we get a, a skew response uh, uh, and we get a get larger uh, uh, section moments for all, all section moments in the, in the north part of the span than the uniform case. 
So to sum up with some uh, conclusions, uh, in complex terrain, uh, extreme non-uniformity can be uh, expected to the extent that it should not be neglected. Um, the inverse nature of the mean wind velocity and the turbulence will to some, some uh, extent cancel out effects of non-uniformity on the buffeting response at least, uh, but a procedure to identify unfavorable combinations may be, uh, may be sought after. So now I will um, give you a little peek into some current uh, developments that we are working on now. Uh, we are looking into methods to account for the turbulence variability effects uh, that we have seen earlier in this presentation. So, if we look at the equation of motion of a dynamic system uh, subjected to stochastic loading, it can be written like this in the frequency domain. Um, these terms are describing the dynamic system. Uh, this term is dis describing the stochastic load, and this term is describing the stochastic response. So, going back to the present methodology addressed earlier, uh, the assumption 1 is related to this term, and assumption 2 is related to this term. Now we want to look at methods that allow us to remove the limitations of these assumptions. So the, the environmental contours method uh, provide the opportunity to, to identify combinations of environmental parameters that uh, that uh, given a statistical return period. So, so the methodology was first developed uh, in offshore engineering, where they wanted to identify critical combinations of uh, significant uh, wave height and uh, peak wave period. Uh, now we can also use this, uh, this approach uh, to account for our turbulence variability. Uh, so if we, we look at only one variable, say the mean wind velocity, as we often do today, uh, the, the environmental contours method would give us two points, uh, one extremely high wind speed and one extremely low wind speed. So of course we are only interested in, in the, the high one. Uh, but given two, two variables, we get a line, and given three variables, we get a surface of... Uh, of combinations of, uh, of uh, variables with the same statistical uh, return period. So from the full-scale measurements, we can clearly see that the, the variability in the turbulence parameters affect the, uh, the buffeting response of the bridge. Um, however, our assumptions uh, are saying that we, we can neglect uh, this uh, variability. Uh, and in practice, this this is really saying that uh, uh, deterministic values for the turbulence variables uh, can be chosen based on codes or qualitative observations from uh, from site measurements. So by using the uh, environmental contours method, we can can identify the actual uh, combinations of variables that give us the the target extreme load combination. So when we choose the extreme load situation uh, based on today's method methodology, we do not really know if we are choosing a conservative or an unconservative situation. So we are introducing uncertainty to our results. Uh, and in this figure you are, uh, you are seeing to the right here, uh, uh, we are looking at lateral, vertical and torsional displacement uh, response responses. and. Um, the, the response amplitude for the Hardanger Bridge is, is uh, colored along the contour, uh, and the, the worst combination is indicated. And as you can see, the maximum response does not correspond to, to the maximum mean wind velocity. So using this method, uh, we are also able to eclipse uh, the measured response scatter instead of what appeared as a line in this plot earlier. So to some uh, final conclusions, so far in my work, um, uh, we see that the methods used to get site-specific information about the wind field need to be uh, properly planned and chosen very carefully to be able to represent what we what we get along the uh, the, uh, the bridge span.
And also a large uh, in homogeneity can be expected, especially for for complex terrain. Uh, and uh, also turbulence variability effects are are important and uh, should be taken into account uh, if we want to reduce uncertainty and and achieve a target reliable uh, reliability in our in our design. So that uh, concludes my uh, presentation. So thank you for your time and attention, and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so uh, are there any questions to to uh, to Martin about the subject? My speaker works. It's very quiet there. <laughs> Hi, uh, I have a question. This is uh, Randy. Hi. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can. Okay. Um, so, um, in paper one, you had these um, terrain maps with some um, some wind directions drawn into them. I don't know if you can find them in yeah, your yeah the the flow patterns. Uh... Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, maybe with the, the roses, perhaps, like this? Yeah. Uh, it was some of the first ones. Uh, so yeah, this, uh, this it is was the first slide, I exactly think. One. Yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. Second one with that the turbulence. One. Yeah. I'm just um, interested in how you find these flow patterns. Well, uh, these are these are kind of um, assumed flow patterns for, uh, for mm -hmm. all of our observations that are indicating this. Uh, so, uh, so the 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 top one for the for the westerly winds is uh, is indicated uh, due to our our changing wind direction along the span, indicating something like this that that okay. uh, that the, the the fjord is gradually channeling the the flow. But also we see this from from how the turbulence. Uh, how the turbulence uh, is changing along the span, and we get a very, very high effect from from uh, from this flow in the northern part part of the span. So, um, so yeah. So these these are these are assumed flow patterns based on our uh, observations. Okay. So is it is it calculated or is it your best guess? No, this is our best guess from what we okay. see from the uh, from the measurements. Yeah. Okay. So you don't have any complicated model or something? That no. Can, uh, no. No. Okay. That was, that was it. Thank that you. That would be interesting, yeah. <laughs> um, hello, can you hear me? This is Jun Gao. Yes, hi. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I have probably two questions. Uh, so the first one is, um, you've been talking about the uncertainties um, that's from the mostly from the environmental sites like the mean velocity or the turbulence intensities. Or, but do you have any comment on the uncertainties for the measurement that uh, you have? Um, yes, of course. Uh, you also have have uncertainties in in uh, in all your uh, testing uh, approaches, uh, whether it's uh, full scale measurements or mass or or. Uh, Wind tunnel tests. So that uh, also includes, of course, uh, some um, uh, some uncertainty. So so this is not uh, not like the the full scale measurements will ne will never give you the exact solution, but it gives you a very good indication uh, of what we can expect. Uh, so. Um, yeah, so but, yeah. But then, do you plan to probably perform some? Um, uncertainty analysis or, or check for, for the measurement uh, you have? Um, um, no, probably not for, for the Hardang Bridge uh, measurement uh, as thus, but, but, uh, but the methodology will, will always be, uh, be re uh, reliant on uh, a good input. So, so we are kind of using the Hardanger Bridge measurements uh, as our input in this case, but but we are we are really looking at uh, the methodology uh, for this 
Yeah. Yeah, because uh, to me, sometimes uh, if you are, because I think you will use the measurement data as a kind of reference check for your numerical uh, procedures, mm -hmm. and and for that case, if there the uncertainty level in the measurement is is quite large, so it can probably uh, mislead uh, you to some extent. Mm. Right. So probably absolutely, it's, it's, uh, uh, yeah. and that is uh, that is also, of course, that is. Um, that is a challenge for all the full-scale emissions. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, yeah. that you always have some uncertainty there also. But um, it might be, it, it can be uh, challenging to uh, to uh, to really estimate the actual uh, uncertainty involved in this. But uh, but I guess um, I think using full-scale measurements like this is kind of it's our best approach at the moment. We don't have anything uh, anything better, so so that is mm -hmm. the, the method. But of course, there there are um, uh, different possibilities and different ways to do full scale measurements also. Yeah. So, yeah. so then my my second question would be: I think in the second paper you you try to study the uh, uh, non homogeneity of the yeah. wind profile and also the, the turbulence densities along the, the bridge and you perform the frequency domain analysis, right? And mm -hmm. have you, um, in, in the simulation you have, um, have you considered the uh, the loads or the wind loads on, on the cables and uh, hangers as well or it's only on the girder? Uh, this is including loads on the, the cables uh, and the girder, uh, yeah. Okay. But, but uh, in the slide, uh, if I'm not uh, misunderstanding, you didn't show any comparison if you are using the, uh, how to say, homogeneous uh, profile to compare with the measurement, right? Only only the comparison between using homogeneous or inhomogeneous, right? Uh, I'm not or, sure uh, what measurements we can... Yeah, no, it's not, uh, no, it's not um, uh, compared with the full-scale measurements. No, yeah. that's that's correct. What we're looking at here is uh, is um, the effect of uh, ba basically okay. the effect of of the section yeah. moments that are uh, are most yeah. interesting. But uh, but we also we also have seen uh, you see this skew skew response, and we have also yeah. seen this from the full-scale measurements that we have a. We have a, a skew response from from the acceleration uh, response yeah. also. Okay, but will that give better uh, how to say comparison uh, with the, the full scale measurement or or not? Um, it uh, it depends, of course, what uh, what position we are looking at. Uh, and uh, uh, my colleague uh, Axel van Ersche, he he uh, included this in one of his uh, papers, but Sorry. he also only looked at the response at the mid span so maybe this will be uh, less affected by such a such a effect yeah it'd be nice to to see the following uh, result uh, i mean direct comparison with with the measurement to see how how the homogeneous wind profile and and uh, the turbulence would it would affect uh, the the result yes i i agree that uh, uh, that would be interesting to dig uh, dig further into yeah okay thank yeah, you thank you Any more questions? Okay. If it's uh, not anything more then we will thank you to Martin for your presentation and uh, I will stop the recording so um, thank you all for participating all right go bye bye